What's up, guys? It's Parnelli X, and this is going to be my Season 13 Warwick Jungle Guide. Now, I have absolutely zero clue what has possessed me the last week, but I've been on fire, and I've been winning and winning and winning, uh, besides this game right here. And I, I'm, like, literally just carrying a ton. I went on a 16-game winning streak, 16 games without losing a game. I, I literally gained 400 LP in the matter of... 24 hours because I've just been completely mentally focused and I've kind of just figured things out for myself. So it's a perfect time for me to give you guys a jungle guide. I think Warwick jungle right now is actually in a, a solid spot. I, I don't think he's OP or anything, but I think he's decent because of recent item buffs, uh, mainly Triforce. So yeah, let's just go ahead and cover it. This is going to be a two hour jungle guide and the general format real quick is going to be, I'm going to cover, you know, the build setups, uh, runes, and just all that to kind of get us started. And then we're going to go into multiple full gameplay commentaries back to back to back, where I'm going to talk about the four key pillars of decision making, I guess is what you would call it. I'm not sure what, what you could call it, but I think decision making is pretty accurate. That helped me a lot with staying consistent and playing my best. And I think it's going to help you guys a lot as well, it'll, and it'll all make sense. All right, Warwick setup. This is going to consist of summoner spells, runes, and items. Now, I'm not going to cover all of the different item options or rune options you can go on Warwick in this video because 95% of the time when I'm covering this video is going to be optimal. Occasionally, you can go something a little bit different, but if I if I, you know, want to cover that, I'll just post a separate video about it or, you know, if I if I happen to have a game where I do something a little bit different. If you happen to have any questions, um, about certain items or runes, you're free to ask in the comment section below. Um, but like I said, this this should be this should cover most of what you need on the current patch. As far as summoner spells is concerned, you're going to be going Ghost Smite. Um, Ghost really just gives Warwick everything he needs. Um, gives him movement speed to you know chase, to stick onto targets, to run away. The resets on it is really, really OP and allows Warwick to not really have any issues with getting kited in team fights. And the lower cooldown compared to Flash is is great. I think that's really like a kind of the big factor here is Warwick needs to have um, as many like high impact spells up as often as possible to make plays. He um, like he needs either his ultimate up or he needs like Ghost or Flash up to make a make. To get kills early on and snowball hard oftentimes so having ghosts up more, more frequently is really really good flash is absolutely an option on warwick it's i mean flash is good on really everyone because it's just it's flash but uh, a couple issues here warwick's base movement speed is pretty low compared to most champions in the game especially melees and as a result if you try to flash away from an enemy a lot of times they can actually just catch up to you which kind of sucks um and again the cooldown is is annoying the one benefit of flash is it allows you to flash onto like the enemy backline a lot more reliably like you can you can kill the enemy adc in team fights more often which is which is um which is cool but i think that ghost gives you a lot more playmaking potential in the early and mid game while still being strong in team fights and then smites you're going to be going because it's smite i don't really need to cover that at least i hope not now as far as your runes Let's actually just talk rune stats real quick. So rune stats, double adaptive, and then scaling health. I mean, technically you could go like armor or MR in certain situations, and that's fine. But scaling health for the most part is just more gold efficient. Double adaptive force is actually better than attack speed adaptive force nowadays. Um, well, it's actually probably about the same, honestly. But your jungle pet damage scales off of bonus AD, so this actually does like help your clear speed a little bit more than attack speed. Um, and also Warwick has really strong AD ratios, so I prefer adaptive force, but it, it's not really a big deal. You can go attack speed if you prefer it, honestly. Now, as far as um, primary runes, this is gonna be like the same every single game. It's not going to change at all. Press the attack is easily the best keystone on Warwick at the moment. Uh, lethal tempo is, is okay, but it's, it's not great. And this is just mainly due to Warwick's W attack speed bug. That makes his attack speed pretty clunky. Um, and also just item synergy. Um, Warwick doesn't really have any good attack speed item rushes right now other than Bork. But Bork Rush is just inferior to the build I'm, 
um, to the build that I'm going to cover in this video. Uh, Triumph is going to be the best bet here because everything in this row sucks for the jungle. Triumph also kind of sucks now because it got nerfed, but it's the best option. Legend Alacrity gives the attack speed, which we love. You can go Legend T Tenacity here if you're playing against a lot of stuns and hard CC. Uh, it did get nerfed a couple patches ago, which kind of sucks. It's, it's it's actually pretty weak right now, but if you're playing against a lot of stuns, it's definitely worth going. But I'd say 90% of the time, just default to Legend Alacrity and you're going to be fine. And then your last primary rune is going to be Last Stand. Warwick is below half health, half the game. So the increased damage is going to be huge, especially in duels. Um, and while Coup de, Coup de Grasse might like look kind of nice because you're hunting targets, if you're if they're really low on HP, you're probably going to be killing them anyways. This is just going to like give you a lot more. It's, it's a perfect rune for Warwick, honestly. Now, as far as secondary runes are concerned, there's a lot of options you could go. You know, you could go something like Eyeball and Relentless Hunter. You could go like Nimbus Cloak and Celerity, something like that, or Conditioning Revitalize. I think that easily the best secondary um, setup here is actually going to be Magical Footwear and Cosmic Insights. Magical Footwear um, is great because it's great for two reasons. First of all, Warwick really wants to um, focus on building his damage items early on ASAP. He doesn't want to build anything defensive. He doesn't want to build movement speed. Warwick needs damage early on because uh, his like his just base damage isn't that great. He needs to have kill pressure on lanes. So you want to be rushing into your items ASAP. Um, and Magical Footwear means you don't, you're not going to have to spend gold on your initial boots per purchase, which is nice. Um, the second reason why this is good is, like I said, Warwick's base movement speed kind of sucks. And the extra 10 movement speed you get from Magical Footwear makes up for this. So it's it's just amazing. Like this is literally like a free 300 gold item that makes up for one of Warwick's weaknesses as well, which is which is awesome. Cosmic Insights uh, is just probably going to be your best option here. I mean, you could go Futures Market or even maybe like Approach Velocity and like could like combo with like, you know, the, the slow and smite or something. But I don't know, probably not worth talking about. Cosmic Insight's probably going to be your most reliable rune here just because uh, Ghost is up more often. And we like that. Like I said, more often Ghost is up, the more often you can get kills. So that is nice. Uh, let's go into items. So the best jungle pet is going to be the blue pet. And that's just because it's kind of overpowered compared, to, or at least it's more powerful than these other jungle pets in general across the majority of champions in the game. Um, but on Warwick in particular, it's it's nice. It just allows you to move across the, the map a lot better. Um, it allows you to escape certain situations. It allows you to chase people down with a bonus movement speed through bushes. It's just very versatile and always useful. So I recommend going the blue pet every single game. Some people might consider the red pet on Warwick. This is honestly terrible. It's easily Warwick's worst pets uh, because like, like range champions use this better because they're able to apply the slow from range and then close the gap or it can't really do that i do not recommend going the scorch claw pup here the green pet is okay as well or sorry it's, it's okay um but it's not it's not blue pet so i just recommend going blue pet every single game don't really think too much about it because there's a clear like discrepancy between blue pet and the other ones especially in work you're also going to start off with an with a health potion like you will on most champions, but for Warwick, it's a tad bit different. Now, Warwick's sustain is obviously very good, so you don't need to pop this health potion for sustain in the jungle. What you are going to do is use this health potion uh, or save this health health potion for fights where you think that it can make the difference in making you tankier. So say that you're fighting the enemy jungler at Scuttlecrab early on, like level 3, level 4. You can pop the health potion at the start of the fights, and the extra healing can make you a lot harder to kill and actually make the difference. Like this is literally just a playmaking tool. If you're ganking bot lane early on and you think that you, you might take too much damage or you want to survive longer, pop the health potion. And uh, yeah, like, like I said, it's just, it's just a very cheap playmaking tool that can help you, you know, sway a fight early on, which can be very, very nice. Um, so I highly recommend just having one HP pot and uh, using it. I wouldn't buy any more, just, just buy one and save it for a, don't, don't, don't have to oversave it, but just use it when you think it's necessary. 
Uh, now, the next item comes to no one's surprise. It's going to be Tiamat. Uh, you're going to rush into Tiamat because, again, Warwick needs damage early on. But he also needs wave clear. Um, he doesn't really need wave clear every single game. If you're ganking a lot and you have a lot of kill opportunities, then you don't really need the wave clear. But the thing is, is that you can't really rely on that. And Tiamat's going to be very consistent. It's going to be very consistent and it's going to help you stay ahead and not fall behind. Because if you don't have Tiamat and you don't have gank opportunities, then you're going to fall behind in pace, you're going to fall behind in levels, and for a champion like Warwick, you can't really afford to do that. Warwick is a champion that likes to snowball and stay ahead, and uh, just, yeah, like have high tempo. You don't want to um, fall behind, and there's no reason to not go TM out rush right now. It's just ideal. Your first core item that you're going to be rushing into is going to be Trinity Force. This is the buff Trinity Force, and... It is the mythic item that I would recommend going on Warwick Jungle 90 to 95% of your games. It really just kind of gives you a little bit of everything, gives you solid DPS, gives you really good burst, it gives you some tankiness, gives you some CDR, gives you some movement speed so you don't get kited. It is awesome. Uh, really key feature here with Trinity Force is the upfront burst from it. Warwick is a champion that his, his damage... Uh, against targets that are above half health is actually really terrible. Warwick is not good at fighting targets that are above half health, but if you have a lot of damage from Trinity Force coming in with your Q, you can bring targets below half health a lot quicker, and then your damage is going to be very solid. So that's why Trinity Force is really good. Overall, strong item, and I recommend going it almost every single game. Uh, now let's just talk boots, because generally speaking at this point, you're going to be building your boots. And uh, it basically kind of goes in this order for me. Uh, it's these three boots I'm going every single game. And I always think Plated Steel Caps is my highest priority boots. I'm always thinking first things first, is Plated Steel Caps going to be good this game? If they are, I'm going to build Plated Steel Caps. If they're not, then um, or they're subpar, I'll consider Mercury Treads. Are Mercury Treads going to be good this game? If they're not, then I'll go into Ionian Boots. So Plated Steel Caps is, um, is great because it's going to make you very, very tanky um, when it's good. Key thing here ab about Plated Steel Caps is that I'm not really thinking about the stats so much. I know a lot of people think of this as armor boots, but the amount of armor you get from Plated Steel Caps, 20 armor, is like 300 gold. That's not very good. It's not like a ton of defenses. So don't build these boots for the armor because like if you're playing versus someone like a cane or a talon they're not auto attacking you much um that like they're not gonna like you're not gonna reduce too much of their damage so they're not gonna be that strong if you're playing some against you know an adc or someone like trinomir play steel caps is very good so if you have like if you're playing against like two or more champions that auto attack frequently um or are fed played steel caps is probably going to be ideal or or say they just have like an absurdly fed adc then you might then you probably are going to want to go play steel caps uh, if play steel caps aren't that great then i'll consider mercury treads similar situation here the stat value isn't that high with the magic resist it's a little bit better but it's, it's still not high I'm, I'm more more so thinking about the tenacity that it provides so if i'm playing against a lot of hard tc stuns slow or uh, not really slows stuns snares Polymorph, stuff like that. Mercury Treads is what I'm going to go. Um, but if neither of these boot, boot options stand up, uh, stand out, say I'm playing against a lot of caster champions that don't have hard CC, playing against a cane, playing against like an AP champion that doesn't have much, like, doesn't have like stuns or CC, um, and like the overall team comp, um, uh, I'm thinking overall team comp here, keep in mind. But if neither of these boots stand out, we're going Onion Boots because work like CDR. Uh, the Summer Spell Haste is great. And the boots are cheap, so these are just going to be like the, the last resort. But uh, And I, st I still build these pretty frequently, I'd say. I'd say I build play steel caps 40% of the time. This is like 30% of the time. This is 30% of the time, essentially speaking. Now, after your boots, we go into Titanic Hydra. Titanic Hydra completes the Tiamat, so it's going to be pretty cheap um, at this point. It gives you some health and tankiness, so you're not too squishy in fights. And obviously some damage, some AOE in fights as well. It just 
I don't know. It's, it's just a really good Warwick item. I don't really know what to say here. It's, it's Titanic Hydra. It's, it's a stat stick on Warwick at this point, but it's really good and it's cheap after you have your team on. So why not round it all out? Um, that this is basically this is right here by the, by the way is basically the core like this is literally just like what i go almost every single game like literally almost every single game my next item i'd say half the time is going to be sterics gauge it's been buffed it gives tenacity it gives some decent ad some health and a, and a very reliable shield which is which is nice it's a low hp shield too which low hp shield is great on work because when you're when the shield pops you're going to be able to heal a lot um like your heal activates at this point so it's 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 helps you uh, you know with being a lot tankier um but the fact that uh, that it pops automatically is, is great um i just say it's it's a very consistent item it's very reliable and it kind of just gives you a little bit of everything that you want for the most part now i will go other items sometimes a uh, third uh let's let's like see what options we have Sometimes maybe a frozen uh, frozen heart. Sometimes randoins. Sometimes thorn mail. Uh, I think that's kind of basically it as far as armor is concerned. Magic resist. Let's see. I've I've gone maw. I've gone maw third instead of instead of Sterex if they have a lot of magic damage burst champions. Absolutely would be a good item. If I, if my team is very AP heavy, I might go abyssal mass. That's a little bit more niche though. Um. Turbo Chem Tank is an option, by the way. It's it's kind of a, a very niche option, but it's there. You can go with sends. Um, basically, like there, there's different options you can go if you feel like like you can adapt here. But I would say that Sterix is kind of like it just doesn't really ever feel bad. And it always works. So I would recommend going Sterix here most of the time. If you think that you can make an adaption in your build that's that's good, then go for it. After Sterix. Um, again, you can go some other item. Um, you can go like any of like, like, like thorn mail. You can go randoms, blah, blah, blah. Actually, GA, by the way, I didn't really mention GA third or fourth is great. If you are ahead, if you are ahead and you have like a big bounty and you're already really hard to kill, why not make yourself harder to kill? GA is great there. Uh, it's kind of a win more item, but it's really good at doing that. But I'd say core after Sterix is going to be Gargoyle Stone Plates. It gives you another shield that you can pop at low HP that can like, it's literally just double super barrier. Everyone knows how good barrier is in Warwick. And the reason why barrier is so good in Warwick top lane is because of, again, the fact that you can heal a bunch um, while you're, while the shield's active. So it just makes you really, really hard to kill. Also combines very well with your E. If you're able to use your E during one of these shields being active, then you're going to essentially double the value of the shield because your E is going to be basically like, it's basically like 50% damage reduction, right? So uh, a 1,000 health shield is going to be essentially 2,000 health during your, your E's time. So that's, that's really good to have. But it gives you a bunch of resist, which at this point you're lacking. You're, you have a lot of health, you're lacking resist. Um, and it gives you CDR as well. So by this point, you just become absurdly tanky. And uh, yeah, yeah, you're absurdly tanky. Last item is going to be really just whatever fits. Um, again, all the items that I mentioned, you can go GA, Thorn Mail, Randwins. You could even go a Dead, Man, Dead Man's if you felt like it. So you can go an MR option. Let's see if there's any other AD options here as well. I feel like there's, oh, Black Cleaver's good sometimes. Black Cleaver's good. Uh, I forgot to mention, by the way, actually, instead of Sterix, or, gar or Gargoyles, something you can go is going to be Kenpunk Chainsword. This is a really good anti-heal option. Um, if you if you need the if you need to be the person to apply you know anti-healing on your team, it's really good because you're gonna have a lot of AOE with uh, Titanic Hydra, so you can apply it super well, and it gives you really good stats. Um, and then I I want to take make a quick shout out. So uh, Spirit Spirit Ocean is also good. Quick shout out. Um, to Silver Mirror Dawn. I, I'm pretty sure, by the way, I've built this a couple times so far. Not not much. I've only built it a couple times. I think this item is actually very strong. If the enemy team has a lot of CC, I think Silver Mirror Dawn actually is good now. It has like has like really good goal efficiency now when it used to be terrible. So just just something I want to throw out there.
Welcome, boys and girls, to game one of the Warwick Jungle Guide. And, uh, like I mentioned before, and every single one of these games, I'm going to talk about one of the four pillars of decision making. Um, I don't know if that, that's really what I should call it. Probably should think of a, a better term for it, but that's what I'll just call it for now. Because it's really just the four things that I think about uh, mentality wise when I'm going into a ranked game. That way I can play my best, I can be consistent, and um, and just constantly improve as a player. I want to make sure that I'm always just pushing myself to play at 100% rather than autopiloting and playing at like 70%. Um, but we'll, we'll talk more about the first pillar later on in this game when we have time. I want to start off talking about just the... What, what you should think about as a jungler. Um, whether you're playing Warwick or not, um, level one, like what is the first thing you should think about? Honestly, I shouldn't even say level one. This, this is something you should think about when you're loading into the game or even a champion select. And that is going to be which lane you want to path towards in the early game. It's, um, there's multiple things to consider here. There's your win condition, your, there's the enemy's win condition. But there's also like which lane is going to be the easiest for you to get a kill in in the early game. as well as the enemy too because you can also consider counter ganks like if for example if they have a lease um who a lot of times is likely to gank bot lane in this situation because it's or in top lane then you can consider you know can we go for a counter gank situation do we have a winning 3v3 bot lane um if i was playing against a lease that would be a pretty easy decision to make this game we're not playing against Elise, that's just a hypothetical, but like you kind of get the gist of it. And this game we decided to path towards bot lane because it's very rare um, that it's like Orn and Fiora are going to be trading blow for blow in the top lane. I mean, you never see like an Orn solo kill a Fiora level 2, right? Well, I guess he just did now, but most of the time you can't really expect it. So you have to kind of play to what you expect. Doesn't mean that you don't really look, you don't want to like not look top lane. Um, you still want to take advantage of opportunities, but I was already in the spot last I jungle when Orn started to uh, combo that Fiora, so Couldn't really help out, but glad it worked out for him um, But right here Bot lane I noticed is very overextended and this is this is a free kill like what you know, what's there not to love here? Um, so we're going to immediately go for it rather than going for scuttle crab. It's just double kill pop ghost collect some gold here and the reason I wanted to play towards bot lane here is because it's a bot lane meta um, over our top lane meta, but also because, yeah, it's Orn top lane and Karthus and Ezreal are going to have a lot of poke, so they there's a good chance that they can probably, um, you know, whittle down their lane opponents and create some blood trails. But at the end of the day, with the current meta of things, at least in higher elo, I like playing towards bot lane by default, unless top lane has really good value but um i'd say like maybe in lower elo it's probably better to do the opposite to default towards top lane because warwick's actually a really good top lane ganker he's a lot better at ganking top lane than he is bot lane but um, when you're like master plus or even diamond plus i'd say bot lane's just a really strong lane it's very snowbally for the most part so playing towards that lane if you can usually reaps some pretty good benefits but uh, we recall, we end up getting our Tiamat here. Obviously, we got a, we got two kills, so quick Tiamat is nice. And the second thing to think about when you are jungling on Warwick, um, again, any jungler in particular, but especially Warwick, is going to be when you're farming your camps. Um, I mean, Warwick's jungle clear is not very complicated. You don't have to like do anything super mechanical to clear fast. You Q the big monster, you auto attack. When your Q's on cooldown, instead of just staring at the monster camp and doing nothing, that is when you want to be looking at the map and seeing what you can do. By the way, look at check out this play right here. So I noticed that Kasten went for a bad room top lane. I want to punish that. Um, so I recognize that I can actually cut him off here to just ruin his lane. I, I can punish him for that mistake really hard for roaming top. I actually don't think I should have um, traded one for one there. I could have just chunked him and walked away. 
and he would have had to recall. That would have been the uh, the optimal play, but overall, still obviously really good. So we, we take it. Um, but yeah, like looking at your camps in between um, when you're farming on Warwick is is key. It doesn't just I don't just mean like you have to stare at your lanes constantly. I I, I mean just like looking at the mini map at the very least. You oftentimes don't even see me look at my lanes directly. Um, you, you see me do that plenty, but I'm looking at the mini map to guide me to which lanes I want to see. I'm looking top lane here because, you know, Fiora has a blood trail. And we're going for this dragon immediately because we have um, Thresh, Thresh in, and Rek'Sai were in base. So we have numbers advantage. Also, Kassadin just came back from lane. This is actually a really key concept, by the way, um, with with getting neutral objectives. Kassadin just came back from, um, he's behind, and he just got back to lane. He's not going to want to contest Dragon because he's behind. He wants to collect the wave. So that's something you got to consider. When, when people are behind, they want to catch up. Uh, they're less likely to scout out neutral objectives. Right here, though, I'm trying to kind of push my lead because I just got level 6, so I'm feeling pretty strong myself a little bit but I actually I, I, I back off because I noticed their bot lanes rotating I'm not gonna over force my aggression here because of the fact that uh, yeah I, I, just, I don't want to die but um, my, my aggression it, it like having to back back off there doesn't mean that my aggression was bad it actually means that um, it's actually pretty good because it forces their bot lane to miss out on a couple minions. You have to rotate towards me. It kind of wastes their time. As long as I don't int there, then it's an overall win for our team. So we just kind of take that. Um, but we're going to go back to farming our camps. But the first pillar that I want to talk about in this game is going to be uh, urgency. To play with urgency in your games. Now, what does that mean? Um, it's something I realized when I was... Uh, I, I don't really know when I realized it, but it's just something like I guess I've noticed like every, every once in a while is that I'll occasionally find myself like I need like 300 gold for an item. Um, this is also a, a really nice power dive, by the way. Uh, we got the, the Karthus support tech, which is nice. But it's free to, well, I don't want to say it's a free two for one. This is obviously very, very close, but. Overall worth it, even though even if that was a two for two, that's still worth it because they miss out on the minions. But um, yeah, so something I've noticed is that like I, I feel like a lot of lot of players um, probably notice this as well. When I when I've I, I found myself in myself in situations where I need like three hundred gold for for an item power spike, and I suddenly just start like farming faster than I have been the rest of the game previously which is like weird like you should be always farming as fast and efficient as possible and for some for whatever reason when i like feel when i'm really close to an item um at times i found myself like you know just you know like kind of like sitting up in my chair a little bit more and just playing more efficiently and it, it's it's things like that that is what i mean with urgency you want to always be playing with urgency you don't want to only play urgent when you have to. You don't want to autopilot. You don't want to um, like you basically kind of want to play like there's like a hot cheerleader watching you on the sideline um, so that you have a little bit of extra motivation. Like You should be your own motivation but do whatever it takes to you know nudge you up a little bit. That, that's like literally exactly what I mean though. Like you should always be thinking fast. You should be trying to play fast and like I said, it doesn't mean you want to play impatient. You want to play smart. But you should be thinking constantly. So when I say play fast, it doesn't actually mean like play as fast as you can and trying to end the game as fast as possible. It just means you're like constantly thinking. You're thinking and you're trying to do... Um, you're just basically trying to do everything as, as efficiently as you can. You don't want to over overanalyze it either, but... This right here it was a really good, uh, really good uh, tower dive potential that kind of you know shows exactly what I mean because we have an opportunity, a very small window. Um, you like 
basically if the if the enemy team is going to give you an inch you want you're going to want to to know how to take that mile you're all, you're going to want to also be in that position to take that mile you're going to want to be able to identify when the inch when the when the inch is given to you so that you can take that mile. um yeah so it's basically like you just want to be you want to pressure whenever you can when you when the when you're able to apply pressure or do do anything you just want to be able to do it don't get lazy in short don't get lazy <laughs> that, that's all it really comes down to um, but it, but it is something to keep in mind and, and that's kind of like the common theme among all these pillars is that they're pretty like simple words of advice they're, they're nothing necessarily gameplay specific it's just more of things that definitely like when I, all these things combines help me play my best um so that i'm prepared to win games and so like you and i don't find myself just autopilot and playing mediocre or tilting and also if you are playing urgence if you're always thinking about your next move and you're adapting and your your, your mind's fully invested on the game itself you're less likely to tilt and care about your teammates you know feeding i mean right here my bot lane's in thing a little bit be fair, I guess they were they've were, they been playing pretty good this game, so overall not too bad. But still, Shut down. I, I don't really care what my what happens to my team. Instead of thinking about my teammates inting here, I'm pushing out the mid lane because I can. I'm, I'm, I'm like, okay, they're bot lane. I'm going to push out mid lane, make them miss the wave, and now we can rotate bot lane and we can punish the situation. I'm trying to adapt, we're constantly adapting, and we're constantly thinking about the enemy's next move and our next move and our teammates next move you know what you've done. right here i probably should have actually taken this dragon i think that this was a bit of a risky move by me i decided to contest this red buff because we have prio um but honestly thresh can come from base here and if i get hooked or something now i position myself to not get hooked but it's still a little bit ballsy i'm not gonna lie so that, that's just my two cents I, I think it would have been better to go for this dragon but it's fine because i was kind of low hp at the start like if wukong came over the wall at a certain time maybe i could have died but we got away with it we got dragon as well we have you know we need 300 gold for titanic hydra so we're just gonna go ahead and probably farm our bot side here i think that'll be enough or Hydra. If not, we'll just go grab Raptors afterwards. And we should be good to go. And I'm I'm paying still paying attention to the map here. I'm trying to like see if I can do anything topside. Obviously it's very far away, but work has a big blood trail, so if someone gets slow enough, maybe I can just hustle over there. But with uh Top lane dead. I think I'm just going to go over here and look to take this scuttle crap. My initial plan was to just recall and get this Titanic Hydra. That's normally what I do, but my mid lane's pushing. My top lane's pushing. We have numbers advantage. So I do kind of want to press our lead a little bit. Um, and I decided to actually counter jungle here because I think I can bully this Wukong out of his own jungle. With that said, Dior comes in with a TP bit unexpected so I just run up here I block the the parry for our Fort Orn and we're able to get the kill she's useless she's like 08 so Karthus supports dealing a ton of damage as well and uh yeah we're just gonna continue counter jungling because we're just in here we could recall and buy our items but we also don't really need to right now there's we don't need our items at the moment because these camps are ours for, for the taking. We're going to take them. And then we also have Herald that's up, so we can take that as well. They're not in a position to contest. My teammates are, are also playing very aggressive at the moment, so. They kind of like give me a little bit of leeway. Because if like it's not like the enemy team is going to contest this Herald right now. They're going to be looking to defend mid or kill this orn right now. They're not going to be looking to go for this herald and it means it's free. We have the opportunity. With that said, this UR does some really weird ass chase here. 
I'm not sure if she was just tilted or coping here. But she goes really far out for this orange, so I'm going to try to cut her off. Get a nice fear off here. I get parried, which sucks. Which slows me a bunch. And even though she's like 08, I know that no one's around, so I just kill her. <laughs> I just I just use my ultimate to kill her. Using my ultimate on the, the uh, zero, zero 06 Fiora there is like not too bad, just because of the fact that I'm recalling anyways. So by, by the time I actually come back, uh, you know, to siege with my team, my ultimate's are already going to be on like a 20, 30 second cooldown maybe. We just Hextech gate over here to the blue buff, and now our team's looking to siege. Normally I would just, I'd just head there, straight there right now, but again, I don't have my ultimates, but I also am about to get a level up, so I want to just get my level up here real quick. And I have the blue pets. Uh, movement speed. When Spotlight just got a kill, I decided to screw it. Let's just grab the Skittle Crab as well while we're here. And our ultimate would be up by the time that we do show up. And we're just kind of kind of look for a flank angle here. War Warwick's not a good seizure, by the way. Uh, when your team is pushing turrets, you're usually not going to be looking to, you know, walk up and auto-attack the turret. You're usually going to kind of play like an assassin. I'll, I'll probably touch more on that a little bit later uh, when it comes to team fighting, but that's like really key to Warwick's play style. I just want to chase down this Aphelios because I thought I could. Sadly, I don't make it. Do the minion there just to get a little bit of a heal off. And, uh... Just gonna keep on sieging here. I was thinking about going for this Thresh, but sadly, Wukong spawns. I, I didn't really pay attention to that. I should have walked away a little, little bit sooner. And now I'm in a bit of a risky spot. What, watch what I do here, though. This is actually like kind of mechanical on Warwick. Notice where I click. I make sure that I click around the wall to the point where I get my movement speed bonus from the Blood Trail uh, against Thresh, even though he's like completely behind me. So I get a little bit of a movement speed bonus, and that helps me walk away, which is pretty nice. But at this point, I'm I kind, of, kind of getting a little... kind of feeling myself a little bit here. I'm like, you know what? I can walk up here, hew him out of the bush, heal up a bunch, and kill him. Even though this guy is actually the most fed person in our team. And it works out. We just kill him like that. Because we have because we know we know our healing. Um, and we have the we had the first move as well. I mean team FF's here. And alright, game number two. Now this one starts off a little bit interesting. Um as you can see, we're doing a level one invade. Now pop uh or contrary to popular belief, Warwick's level one invades are not very good. Um assuming we were talking 5v5. Yeah, Warwick's really good in a 1v1 duel in the top lane, but if you're, you know, running into five people, you're going to get, like, one shot and die. You don't get value from your healing if you're in the middle of a bunch of people, unless you start your E. But if you do start your E in an invade, like, you better make sure that you win the invade, or else your, your clear is going to be pretty slow, because your E is literally useless in the jungle. But uh, we're tr me and Master E decided to trade red buffs here. He goes for an invade. And uh, my GP yoinks it. This right here is awesome. And because this dude's really low HP and level one, I'm thinking, and also LeBlanc's overextended. So what I'm thinking here is something really interesting. I'm like, you know what? I can walk up, chunk this LeBlanc, and this will give me complete mid prio to go over and try to kill this Master Yi. Which I end up doing, but that was, that was ballsy by me. I'm not gonna lie. That, that was like probably a little bit too ham. I probably could have just looped around and bullied him out of the blue side, but hey, it worked out. Um, immediately afterwards, we're going for this blue buff. And uh, yeah, if, if Master G comes and shows up here, he's obviously going to get kind of wrecked. So that's what I'm kind of banking on. And, and as you'd expect, he shows up at this blue buff trying to get something. Flashes away here. And um, you might wonder why I don't chase him here. And it's just because of the fact that LeBlanc is near. He can easily walk towards his LeBlanc. And I won't end up killing him. So I'm thinking, damn, 
Uh, I'm getting collapsed in here. I need to get level 3 ASAP so I can fight back. And I do end up getting level 3 off of, off of this wolf camp. But sadly, we end up dying. I, I do, do dish out a decent amount of damage. Um, Gangplank throws down the worst barrel combo of all time. But he, you know, has a fiery blade that finishes it off. We got a pickaxe, so we're just going to head towards our blue side now. And overall, this trade... Um, Ends up being a one for two trades, so not in our favor. I mean, overall, we still have a, have a really good lead, though. Um, so, not too, not too bad. We're, we're in a decent spot, but kind of unfortunate that that fight didn't go slightly better. I, I personally think I actually kind of played it fine. But uh, their bot lane is kind of pushed out a little bit, and I still have a blood trail on this Master Yi, so I'm like, you know what, let's just go kill him. Let's make this man's life a living hell. Our bot lane is a lot stronger than theirs, so if they want to rotate, we'll just win the fight anyways. We're able to follow up follow up with a nice gank. I focus the Nami because Ezreal's just dead. Um, Ezreal's dead there, so let's just kind of force Nami out of the lane. I'm going to help push in uh, the minions here. And then bot lane's going to be able to get a good reset. And uh, I'm trying to... So I decided to try to cancel this Nami's recall here. Before I head back to my jungle. Again, we're in a really, really good spot right now. So let's just power farm while we're at it. And uh, yeah, we got really nothing going on. So th the second concept to talk about in this video. Or in this game. Is going to be... The second pillar of decision making, that is, is going to be the jungle hierarchy, which is a concept I've talked about multiple times on my channel before. But I think it's actually like a really key like order of priority of things in the early and mid game as a jungler that can help you, you know, stay proactive. I mean, actually, that's that's basically at the end of the day what all it's about, just about staying proactive and knowing what's important. Um, essentially, what the jungle hierarchy is. Is the idea that taking objectives is more important than getting kills. Is more important than counter jungling. Which is more important than taking your own jungle camps. But you want to make sure that you're doing one of those four things. So by default, you're, you're at the very least going to be farming. But if you have the opportunity to take an objective, you're going to go for it. If you have the opportunity to go for a kill... And the objective is not free in front of your eyes, then you're going to go for the kill. Um, that that's basically what it means. It's just kind of keeping your priority straight. And I, I find it pretty helpful. Of course, there's a lot of nuances to consider. Um, it's not always that simple. Sometimes you do want to go for a kill rather than go for an objective. Um, sometimes you want to just farm a camp instead of going for a kill for whatever reason um, or starting an objective. But uh, in general, that's just kind of the way you should prioritize things because the, most of the time it's it's just better that way. Um, me and Gangplank, or sorry, not Gangplank, me and Garen decided to chase this LeBlanc here. Ooh, and she just gets away just a little bit. This this actually is kind of bad. I tried to chase her a little bit, and I'm you know I don't want to. I want to try to get the kill, but. I get chained up, and I didn't really plan on getting snared. My idea was I can either sidestep the chain, or if she chains me, I can just walk away and uh, not get snared. But I got snared, which is not part of the plan, so we end up dying here, sadly. Kind of threw our lead a tad. This is actually pretty bad because Master Yi took my topside jungle. Um, or at least he took like one or two camps up here. So he's actually kind of back in the game here. At least he's able to breathe. He's actually up a level on me, technically. Even though I need like 2 HP, or sorry, 2 XP. Yeah, I come up here, I notice my Krugs are gone. Go back to my red buff, and well, that's up, so we'll take that. Um, But yeah, like um, like I said, there's a lot of nuance in things here. Um, when I am talking about like the order of priority of things. When I say that like objectives are most important, I don't mean you should always go for objectives anytime you can. I'm saying, like, if the odds are in your favor, if you feel really confident you can take the objective, then you take the objective. If you feel confident. 
Um, if you feel like it's coin flip or it's risky or forced, then don't do it. It's just more about like when you, if you have the confidence, you feel like that um, the odds are significantly in your favor. Like maybe like 60-70% type of play. Then then go for it. Uh, you shouldn't be going for ganks if they if they feel like there's like a 40% chance it's going to work. You, sh you should go for ganks if you feel like there's a good chance that it's going to work. Otherwise, it's not worth ganking because then you're probably going to fall behind. Again, there are nuances. Sometimes maybe it is worth. If you're behind and there's a big bounty or something like that. But for the most part, just play towards the odds. And that goes with like all the concepts I'm going to talk about throughout this video. Because it really is like... Like solo queue is a game of odds. If you're always if you're playing so that the odds are always in your favor, then you're going to win most of the time, generally speaking. Right there, I actually misplayed that uh, Mordekaiser gank. By the way, I could have queued his ultimates. Sadly, I, I died to this flank. I I was thinking that mastery could be there, but I didn't expect Nami, and Nami being there just is the, is the turning factor. But I did misplay that that Mordekaiser gank, um, even though it still worked out. You can actually react to Mordekaiser's ultimate by holding Q and just completely negating his ultimate. Goes on cooldown and everything. So, but it still works out. Like I said, just something that I could have done better. As long as you anticipate it, you can do it. Uh, Master Yi takes advantage of the fact that I'm dead. You know, he's 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 paying attention to the jungle hierarchy. He's not sitting back and just farming his camps after killing me he's going to he recognizes that there's an opening for him to get something more important which is going to be the neutral objective so he takes the neutral objective um i got nothing to do right now there's not really any like opportunities for me so i'm just gonna farm with that said i noticed this nautilus is mid so i'm like hmm i can maybe head over in this direction i don't think i do it yet actually Well, I guess I, yeah. So right, right now, right now I head mid. So yeah, once the Blanc is chunked over and I have a blood trail and Nihilus is over here, I'm like, you know what? I can maybe look for a mid lane here. But then I realize the Blanc's kind of, you know, she's not pushed too far forward, so it's gonna be hard for me to kill her because it's Blanc. And and bot lane is also overextended, and I have Ghost up and I have ultimates, and I think that me and Kaisa can just kill these two people. So I decided to go for this instead. We end up getting the kill mid lane too, which is nice, but I think this is going to be the better play. Like, it's, it's very likely that we can pick up both these kills. So we go for it. And we kill the Ezreal. And luckily Nautilus comes down and lands the, the hook, and we get a double kill. Big play. Found the opportunity to go for the gank. We go for it. Also with Warwick, by the way, in particular, uh, your ultimates is a huge window to go for these games. It's a very, very big window. Um, when you when you don't have your ultimate up, a lot of times you're really banking on enemies to be severely overextended and you to have ghost up or just like for them to have a blood tree on them. Right here, by the way, we're able to go for this neutral objective. We're able to go for this. But the reason why the odds are in my favor here is because Mastery is obviously gonna go, going to go for my Kai'Sa before he goes for the... Well, actually, so it's basically like two things here. Either Mastery can either go for my Kai'Sa there and kill the Kai'Sa, which he did, sadly. Overall, still worth it. Or, if he tries to contest me at the Dragon without going for the Kai'Sa, then we have Kai'Sa there, which means we have numbers advantage. So he can't really actually realistically ever contest that Dragon. I'm able to kill it in time before he's able to kill Kai'Sa and then contest. So it's free. So we take it. Um... Yeah, we're building our Triforce now. Let's just head top side. Ultimate's coming up. Like I said, that that's the window we look for as Warwick. That's where our odds of, of a successful gank kind of go up significantly. Like the odds of, of ganking LeBlanc right now without our ultimate is like 1 in 10. The odds of us killing her with her ultimate up is... Well, you know, it's, it's, it's higher. That, that, it's, it's higher. It's not, I, don't, I won't say it's good odds right now. She has to be chunked a little bit more because it's still LeBlanc. But you kind of get the gist of what I'm saying. 
Uh, I noticed that Mordekaiser is starting to kind of push up a little bit. I actually think I did misplay here a little bit because I think, um, you know, according to the jungle hierarchy with seeing Master Yi bot lane, I probably should have gone for a counter jungle here instead of taking my own camps, but uh, I just decided to take my own camps for whatever reason. And uh, come up for this 2v2. Gameplay actually kind of trolled that. I'm pretty sure if he just didn't orange and just fought Mordekaiser and his ultimate, he would have got the kill. But yeah, I, I do think I misplayed this. I think um, instead of going for Krugs and Red, I should have just taken Mastery's jungle when I saw him bot lane. Uh, and, and the reason is because the reason why counter jungling is more important than your camps, well, one, it's because of the fact that, uh, you know, they're taking from him. But also, it's the opportunity. Like, your camps, the reason why at the bottom of the list of the hierarchy is your camps is because of the fact that they are, um, they're always up. They're always up, they're always available, and they're always easy to access. You know, a dragon or a rift herald is, like, less common for you to, like, find, an, find a uh, situation where it's going to be easy to take. Kills are, are situational. Um, counter jungling is situational. So you like when you have the when the situation present itself, you want to capitalize it when you can, and that's part of just being proactive. You don't want you want you don't want to find yourself like autopiloting. I mean, really, what this does actually is um, this concept kind of has helped me in the past because I used to get in the habit that a lot of junglers have, which is just autopilot farming. Full clearing, thinking about, you know, how you're going to, you know, path top to bot lane and reset and stuff like that. When in reality, that's like what you do when there's nothing going on. Like you want to path efficiently um, when you like just when you're not doing anything else. But that shouldn't be your goal. Your goal shouldn't be to power farm. Um, even if you're like a champion that does farm a lot, like that's not like your main game plan. It can be an expectation, but not a game plan. If you're playing Shivana and you have a kill opportunity, you you, you love that kill opportunity. You, you're going to go for it because it's it's rare you find that 3-6 in Shivana. Right here. We have Ghost up, so we can just sprint at the Sablanc even though she has a bunch of dashes. Makes her an easy kill. And uh, Nami and Yi are here, which makes this a little bit sketchy. Nice sidestep by me on this bubble. And uh, I don't. The reason why I don't focus this Master Yi is because he needs to be low HP for me to do much damage to him. He's gonna out DPS me if I don't. Really good Q follow here. Followed the Q, avoided the bubble. Also escaped tower range, which is really nice. And now that Ezreal is trapped here, I'm pinging my Nautilus to just dive this man. Once he starts taking this turret, even if I get exhausted, which is a free kill and a free turret. Really good stuff there. And Dragon's actually coming up here somewhat soon as well. So I think we can just take these Krogs and probably reset for our Titanic Hydra. And then we can play for a neutral objective. I guess I just end up just kind of taking everything. LeBlanc and Mordekaiser are up toppling as well. And we're also just stronger than the enemy team. So it's like not like they can really contest these, uh, these neutral objectives. So we, ju we just kind of go for it now. Because of the fact that there's two top lane. Two top lane. They're coming from base. Because they're coming from base, it's it's going to be much riskier for them to come just straight to the dragon and contest. They're going to be kind of giving up some waves, and some lane prio. They actually do go for this. Um, but the reason why I'm not too worried about the situation. Really good ultimate by me there. But... One of the one of the reasons I mean the reasons I mentioned were obviously um, why I felt good about this dragon, but also I was thinking about what what do like in, in this situation if they do contest this dragon, what do they need to do? What what needs to happen for them to win this team fight? And what needs for the what needs to happen on their team is for Master Yi to just kind of one v nine the fight. Um, if we kill Master Yi, which we can do very easily with me and Nautilus, then we'll wipe that. Even though LeBlanc has a couple kills, she's not going to be able to do that much. We're, we're kind of too tanky. So, I just kind of came to that fight prepared 
And because I was prepared, I knew we can get away with, uh... I knew, I knew we could get away with doing that dragon right there, even though we're sitting on a bunch of gold ourselves. Because we can just easily take away their carry. And now we're going to build into Guardian Angel because we're really far ahead. We have a big bounty. It's very hard for them to kill me. So why not, you know, force them to kill me twice? If I can force them to kill me twice, they don't have much DPS as well. It's just going to be impossible for them to ever win any of these fights. GA is a really good win more item. Like, if you're ever really ahead like this, GA is so good. Um, especially if they're bursty. If they're DPS-y, then maybe not as much. Um, maybe it's not as good. But if they're, like, very reliant on, like, resets, like Master Yi, or they just have a lot of burst combos they have to use on you, like LeBlanc, then they're going to be kind of screwed if you happen to them. Again, going for the neutral objective here, because we can. I took the red buff because it was on my path and it was, uh, you know, took like two seconds to, to get. Also, it also ends up going over to the Kaiso as well, which is nice. And now we're just looking for a flank on this Ezreal. I actually forces Flash by <laughs> basically poking him down. That right there is not poke though. That right there is a 100 to zero. So little kill on the Master Yi. As you can see, the Triforce damage is pretty ridiculous right now. And uh, w watch, by the way, how I play this situation. So this right here looks absolutely psychotic, and it is. But it's actually pretty smart uh, because of the fact that I have Stopwatch. I'm uh, using the fact that I have Stopwatch here um, because I can just go for the turret dive. My teammates can come and fly me in. And if I'm about to die, all I have to do is Stopwatch. And... It's just two kills for free for, for stopwatch, which is really good value. And I do the exact same thing here as well, by the way. Right, exact same thing right there. I have stopwatch, so we can go for a really aggressive play on the Mordekaiser, and it works. And I don't, I still don't, I still have my stopwatch. I don't even need to use it, which is uh, extra awesome. So this is actually a really good value stopwatch because if I didn't have this item, I wouldn't have gone for those two plays. Uh, this play right here is a bit much. It's a bit much. Um, but we're able to get away with it. We're feeling ourselves. We're feeling confident. We had, we had our team to back back ourselves up, so it wasn't like it wasn't calculated. It was just more of if I hit my ultimate, that would have been a good play, but because I didn't hit my ultimate, it was a little bit risky. You know, I risk giving away my bounty. But two people are dead, including their jungler. Easy Baron call. The moment you have the opportunity to go for Baron, you just take it. I actually should have pinged the Baron. My teammate, I like. My teammates kind of pinged it themselves. But I should have been the one demanding that we take Baron because. You know, you, sh you should always be the one, you know, making sure your teammates are staying proactive. And they don't, like, forget that we can just, you know, take Baron. Because that happens a lot in Siliki. A lot of times people just kill the enemy team and then they just recall or they split push. And then it's like, wait, we can just take Baron and push our lead right now. The jungle hierarchy, though, as I mentioned, it's kind of more of like... It doesn't matter as much at this point in the game. Once the lanes are kind of wide open, I mean, I guess it still holds up a little bit. But the nuances, I guess, kind of more there as well. Um, it's not as as clear. Like sometimes it's just not really worth going for an objective over going for some kills. Like sometimes kills are just worth more in the mid late game. So the jungle hierarchy is more of like a like an early mid game jungle concept. But I think it's very helpful just in terms of just making sure that you always know what to do. And again, it's about making sure you're always doing something. You want to make sure you're always doing something. You're not running around in circles. You're not standing in a bush forever without any, like, purpose. You're not running back and forth. You just want to make sure you're always doing one of those things, and you're going to stay ahead in your games. You're going to find opportunities to uh, get leads. Right here, by the way, I have GA. Similar, similar to, you know, when I had my stopwatch, I have GA. I can just run straight at this Mordekaiser. He's their only wave clear. Now they don't have wave clear because he ults me. And we still got it alive. He's, uh, oh, so these minions are bugged too. Right there. Another clean game. 
with the jungle hierarchy in place. Welcome back, boys and girls, to game number three. The next concept, or the third pillar of decision making that I want to talk about in this game is going to be to make the game simple and easy for your team. Now, what I mean by that is not necessarily to play like a supportive play style and to, uh, you know, you know, hover your teammates, sacrifice farm, or give them all the kills or anything like that. That's not what I mean at all. Um, I'm just saying like, you know, kind of picture that you're playing with Faker or Canyon in solo queue. What, what's that going to look like? What, what's a real challenger smurf in your game games going to look like? Um, they're not going to be, you know, saying, you know, you know, just just don't die. I'll carry at 20 minutes. They're not going to be saying that. They're not going to be asking for your, their teammates to just simply not die and to, you know, just power farm or anything like that. That's not like a very consistent play style. It's not reliable. It's not, it's, it's just not good. Um, what they're going to do is they're going to make the game easy for everyone involved. Like everyone, especially a junglers, because junglers can influence every single lane. So if you have a challenger jungler on their team, it's going to feel awesome. The jungler is going to be there when you want him to be there. And that that right there is exactly what I mean. Um, yeah, it's, it's not about, you know, just playing overly for your team. You still can play, you know, you can make the, the game easy for your team. Uh, make it as simple simple for your team as possible, and also still like 1v9. It's just that there's like a play style that's like pretty... Um, a lot of junglers have this like mindset, I guess, of my teammates are really bad, therefore I have to get all the resources, and I can't trust my teammates to do, my teammates to do anything, so I gotta just hope that they don't, you know, die, and... Just try to get enough, you know, resources that I can hard carry these team fights, and that that really is just a bad mindset. What you should do is instead of trying to, um, well, I guess like the one thing about that mindset itself is that if you think that your teammates are bad, it's not a good idea to ask for them to, you know, deal with a lot of pressure in lane or through jungle ganks. Or to you know play safe in tough situations. You you don't want basically you don't want your teammates to be making the tough decisions or the tough plays. You should trust yourself to do all that. You should be the manager of the business, basically. Um, you know, make it so that your teammates are doing the easy stuff. You're doing the hard stuff. So for example, if uh, we have a LeBlanc top versus Fiora here, uh, imagine that Le if LeBlanc is like pushing this Fiora under the turrets. She's half HP, and Fiora's getting kind of bullied under her tower. She's going to be thinking, you know, where the hell is where the hell is Warwick here? Warwick could gank this LeBlanc and we can kill her. And yeah, like in those situations, you want to be there and um, essentially like think about what your teammates want, what they need, kind of just get into their minds. As someone who has played plenty of top lane Warwick, mid lane Warwick, I mean, I've played every role in the game, so I know the feeling of feeling abandoned by your jungler and feeling like, damn, if my jungler was here, um, it would either, you know, like, help relieve a lot of pressure I'm feeling in my lane, or it might just completely win my lane. And that, that right there is exactly what I'm talking about. Now, if, if your teammates are, like, feeding relentlessly or they're making mistakes a bunch, that's not, like, you, you don't really have to cover for that, or well, you shouldn't cover for that, is what I mean. If your top laner is getting solo killed, and it's a stupid solo death, that's not really your fault. And that's not, not something that you should be trying to cover for. Um, you're not, like, like you're not trying to, the, the goal isn't to cover for your teammates' mistakes. It's to prevent your teammates from being in a position where they're able to make mistakes, basically. And you're also denying the enemy team opportunities to make plays that can push leads for themselves. You'll see it a lot in this game. Um, I mean, right there, I, I obviously I already got a couple kills from that um, 
helping join Silas in that 2v2, but that's going to be a consistent theme this game. Um, Silas is laning versus Rumble, and he's also playing versus Nocturne Jungle, which are two you know, melee bruisers that can definitely make the game very difficult for Silas. It can make it really hard for him to breathe. There's also a roaming, roaming galley of this game as well, so it's, it's very tough for Silas. My goal, um, seeing him, you know, be pressured constantly in this game, is going to be to make sure, or at least try my best to ensure that he goes even in lane, or even comes out ahead. I want to counter the pressure they're putting on him, so that he isn't in a position where he screws up and ends up feeding, or, you know, has to make like a decision between, you know, collecting like two waves into the turret or giving it up. Like stuff like that. I'd rather just be there and make sure and like be there to ensure that he doesn't get towered of so that he can collect the wave for free. And it's just pressure relief. It's simple. It's easy. Um, that, that That's like kind of the core concept that I'm talking about um, with making the game simple for your team. It's just doesn't necessarily mean that you're playing for your team. I also want to mention that it's not necessarily, when I say playing for your team, I don't mean playing for your specific teammate. I just talked about Silas, but the only reason I'm playing for Silas is because of the fact that I, I think that's like a win con we can play around. I'm not playing, you know, I, I, I don't mean like if my bot lane's losing, that I have to play for, for my bot lane, or that I have to make sure that every lane is comfortable. I just have to play towards the win con. I have, I have to make sure that the team is overall as a whole is in the easiest position possible to win the game and that again that can also include me just you know farming when i have to and staying ahead or even just getting all the kills it's just it's just thinking it's it's playing smart at the at the end of the day it's all about playing smart that's, that's all i'm really mentioning in this video but it's these pillars are ways of thinking or you know your mentality going into solo queue that kind of guide you to playing smart. At least they guide me to playing smart. So hopefully it helps you as well. Um, right here though, we're going to go ahead and just power farm our, our bot side because we wanted to get to our Triforce as soon as possible. Lost our blue sadly. Um, I think right here. Well, let, 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 let's, let's think. Okay, so we can recall to buy our items here. We have no ultimate. Now, my bot lane's a little bit overextended, but we know that Nocturne isn't uh, down here. And um, so there's no need to like really hover. And honestly, with without our ultimate, it's going to be kind of hard to hover anyways. So we're not going to force ourselves to stay for them. We're just going to recall, get our items, head towards top side. And now with our ultimate coming up, we see that LeBlanc is pushing in to, into this Fiora. And again, we can maybe make a play mid lane as well. I'm going for my red buff first. Fiora is slow pushing. So her, her lane is might, might get frozen on here. Which is something to consider. Um, but I think that she can maybe maybe uh, poke this LeBlanc a couple times. And then we can go for a tower dive. And she ends up just solo killing here completely. So that's we take that. Oh, we see Nocturne's bot lane. I can't do anything bot lane because of the fact that, you know, well, it's just too far away. So we're just going to counter jungle while we can. Bot lane's able to turn it, which is huge. And I see that Rumble. There's no more camps for me to farm. And I also see that Rumble is kind of in the halfway point in the lane. So I think I can maybe gank him here with my ultimate. And he walks away. Um, I was hoping that he'd go for that cannon minion, but he didn't. So, now eh, we just walk away. I don't want to waste too much time. I want to make sure that I'm always staying up in the pace. If I felt like, you know, sitting sitting in the fog of war for, for five seconds greatly increases my, cha my chances of getting killed, then I would do it. But it didn't feel like the odds increased that much. So I felt like it's better to just run through mid lane, go back to my camps. And right here is exactly what I was talking about earlier. Silas has a huge wave under the turret. Galio is roaming. And I'm just kind of here to make sure that he can farm uh, safely. So that he doesn't have to be the, like, he doesn't have to, you know, try to farm a wave contested. 
Now, luckily, Lux is here as well, and Silas gets a really good Galio alt steal, so we're able to turn that fight, get two kills. Overall, really good. Let's just go ahead and grab a plate here as well. Why not? You know, I have Lux here to defend me if Nakam wants to fight, so we can just walk away. I'm really close to my Triforce. So we're just going to go ahead and uh, grab the Scuttle Crab. And generally speaking, I actually I wouldn't go for this dragon here, but we end up going for it because Silas TPs. The reason why I wouldn't go before is because I don't have ultimates and there are the enemy teams coming from base. But because Silas TP'd mid, that means that we now have mid prior all of a sudden. So they're not able to really get into this dragon area comfortably. Ash gets ulted by the Nocturne, which is fine. We're on dragon. It's fine. We'll take it. Whatever. There's nothing we can do about it. And instead of recalling right now, I noticed that Lux is going to try to push out this wave. And I'm kind of thinking about what the enemy wants to do right now. Like this Kaisa is thinking Ash is dead and a Lux support is trying to push out this wave. And she's, you know, she's playing Kaisa. So she's probably going to think, you know, I can solo kill this Lux so to support, right? So I was just sitting in the bush waiting for her to go in. And we're able to get a free kill because of it. It's kind of like a... That's like a pretty good play for me to go for. Because even if Kaisa doesn't go in. We're still able to get the wave pushed in and crash it. Um, but if she does go in. Then we're able to get the kill. So it's it's nice. And because she's dead. Nocturne's mid lane. No one's bot lane at all. We can just go ahead and work on this turret. And try to get first tower. Now this... I'm going to have to take some tower damage here, though, is the thing. We're going to use our E for two Sheen procs. Get the minion. Full extra healing. Honestly, wouldn't even mind executing to the turret there, because I have to recall anyways. So it was whatever. So pretty fearless. But now we have to reset, get our Triforce. And it's definitely a Merc Treads game. This is definitely a Merc Treads game. Absolutely. They have LeBlanc Chains, Nocturne, Heather, Galio W, a lot of reliable and long hard CC. So, Merc Treads is really, really good value here. And by the way, really, know, what, know where I go right here. I go to my Raptors instead of my Krugs or my Gromp. And the reason I'm doing that is because I noticed that my mid lane. My, my champions that are mid lane, my allies that are mid lane here, are pushing mid. Um, and they're they're like the most aggro, aggro people on the map. So they're going to be like more vulnerable. They're the aggressors in this situation, so I want to back them up. And it worked out perfectly. That right there is exactly what I mean. I backed up my teammates. I'm aware of what they want to do and what they're able to do. I think them pushing is smart as long as I'm there. If they're inting, then I, then I won't back them up because they're just inting. But they're not anything because I'm able to back them up and we're able to make something happen because of it. Do a little counter jungle. I'm gonna blast one over here, and I can't really kill this LeBlanc because she's a Blanc and she's also full HP. So I'm gonna have to wait for some help from my allies. I'm hoping that she pushes out this wave and then starts to attack the turret. And I think she does. Yeah, she does. And Galio just ults in. I, I don't know what this man is thinking. Um, maybe he like just didn't expect Silas to show up or something. Or maybe he was inting. I have no clue, but whatever. We'll take it. Now we're just going to go back to kind of farming our camps. And I think we are able to get this red buff and maybe recall for Titanic. Actually, no, no, no. Instead of recalling for Titanic, we'll just grab this Herald. Because Nocturne's bot lane. Top lane, we have Cryo. LeBlanc's dead. This is a free Herald. I do have to, I do have to pay attention, though, to like any fights I can join as well. Um, kind of like an add-on to the jungle hierarchy I mentioned in the last game. The jungle hierarchy is like we're saying. Like I'm saying one objective is more important than one kill. But a team fight... Is multiple kills, and that is usually worth more than an objective, unless it's like Baron. So, something that's worth keeping in mind is that if you have the ability to join a fight for like to swing a team fight, then, then go for it. It also 
a lot of times can actually set up for a objective as well. So if you're wanting to like take Herald, joining a team fight might mean that you're able to just get the Herald anyways after you win it. And again, that, that is that is assuming that you think you that joining it's going to win a free. If you think that joining a team fight is bad, or you're only joining a team fight because you feel like your teammates are inting and you just wanna like you wanna like make them int less basically. You're like, well, we're probably if if I don't join, four people are gonna die, but if I do join, only two people are gonna die. Kind of a bad mindset, honestly. You should be trying to play proactive, um, not playing too defensively, don't play too insecure. Just trust yourself, be confident. Your teammates are gonna screw up plenty of times, but it's whatever. That's just part of the game. Just as long as you're like always doing something in response, you can kind of counter any like advantages that enemy team is getting. Like if my teammates teammates died bot lane while I was top lane, I could have just pushed in the turrets, heralded top lane, and gotten the top turret. And then that's like a in, in a way that's like an even trade. Right here, though, my, my entire team's here to back me up, so I'm just going to run straight at them, get a big AoE if you're off. I normally advise against running straight at the enemy team, but because we're ahead, my team is here there to back me up. We can go for the pick. The, the picks. Killed three people. Let's go for this dragon. We're getting closer to the soul now, which is really good. Wow, we actually, never mind. We only have one dragon. I thought we, I thought we had two here. Whatever. Still something though. Still an objective. And now because our entire team is, is pressuring, instead of going back to our jungle and farming up, we're gonna pressure with the team. We got Harold as well. So we know our, our teammates in the mid lane are gonna be able to kill that mid lane turret, which they do. But we have Rift Herald here, so we're gonna be able to just drop it. And I, 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 I'm trying to like kind of move up here to create some space for my team to hit the turrets, but this Rift Herald takes forever. Feels like to kill the turrets. And I also basically stood on the Rumble Alts, which was not good. I ended up dying, giving away my bounty over to the ice here, which sucks. Definitely a misplay in my end, but we're, we're up so much that it ends up not really mattering. It's good, but it's fine. It's whatever. Oh, we're able to get inhib off of this. Take. <clears throat> Obviously, um, yeah, we're, we're up a ton, so it doesn't really matter at the end of the day, but still want to avoid any potential throw. And obviously, like, if there was, like, a blueprint blueprint towards throwing this game, it would be feeding the Kai'Sa, giving her bounties, so we want to be careful about that. Nocturne's able to get another bounty as well on the Ash. But right now, we'll just go ahead and... Go to our, our blue side jungle while our team is in base. Ash is dead as well. We're probably going to just go look to play for this Baron when it comes up here in about 30 seconds. I'm going to grab my blue buff, grab Scuttle Crab, go back to my blue side jungle and farm. This is the plan initially. But we see that Kai'Sa shows up on the on the mini map alone in the bot side. Galio LeBlanc, LeBlanc is top. Um, we, the only teammate that could be here to help Kaisa is Nocturne, which wouldn't really matter. Still be able to 1v2, so we can kill her for free. Easiest kill of all time. But even though that, that's like the easiest kill of all time, that, that right there is exactly what I do in most of my my games in the mid to late game as Warwick. Is looking for picks in the side lane. Warwick is fantastic at it. Um, if you're behind, it's a great way of you know finding a pick to help you come back. Just you can't team fight. And if you're ahead, it's it's just a really good way of pushing your lead. And yeah, it's just a really amazing strength that Warwick has. And that's like one of your like tools. Assuming team fighting isn't, isn't easy. I mean, at the end of the day, if you can just team fight, you team fight. If you can just group and end, you do that. But if you're not team fighting, you're going to be looking for picks in the side lane as Warwick. The little words of wisdom there. But now we're just going to go ahead and start this this Baron. That play by me, by me right there was kind of ints. It was very forced, but works out. 
I, I think it was kind of bad because my teammates weren't there to back me up, so it was a bit risky. But it does give us enough space to go over, go ahead and grab this Baron. And after taking this Baron, I know that my teammates are going to look to push, push mid. I think that we probably should be able to. We probably should be pushing top and and mid in this situation. So I head top lane to just get the shoving in because I want to end this game as soon as possible. Uh, a little bit of a misplay in my ends is not looking mid here and seeing how that fight is going. Because I mean, Silas is pretty low. You know, obviously we're up a ton, so it's like fine, but I still should be like paying attention and seeing where my, like what's happening, what, how the fights are going for us, but it's fine. Um, we're just shoving in top lane as soon as possible, but we want to get three in Hibs and then we can just essentially just tower dive for the game. That's what we're aiming for here. And uh, yeah, we're just basically waiting for minions. But yeah, actually, this right here is a really weird situation. I ulted the Nocturne, but he spell shielded my ult. And uh, I, I can't really do too much here because of the fact that I'm not very good at the siege. I'm trying to create some space where I can for the team, the squad. And we actually we end up losing the Fiora and the Silas, so we have to actually disengage this situation. We kind of walk away together. We can't split up. LeBlanc will pick us apart if we do. Really good flash by Lux there. Able to kill the LeBlanc. I'm low HP here, but it's support Galio. Pretty easy. Um, unfortunately, we can't actually do anything off of that. Like, we can't end the game off of it, but it's fine. We'll just counter jungle in the meantime. And then grab this dragon. Honestly, you know, I probably shouldn't have grabbed that red. I probably should have just reset. Because my teammates are just spawning. And I have a ton of gold to spend. It's better than taking the dragon and then resetting. Because then you're still delaying the game by like 20 seconds for no reason. That also gives the enemy team time to farm in their base. This, this is definitely a case of over farming. I could have just recalled after we got the, those double kills. That's fine. Just grab Sterics Gauge, build into GA. And now we have Stopwatch, which will allow us to... We should be able to end the game pretty easily here. Taking a short detour over to this red buff. We can. But with Stopwatch, I can just Tower Dive. And uh, we should be good. Just in the game. They do have a lot of CC and they're pretty tanky, so I do gotta be careful. I can't overforce the tower dive, but um, my teammate gets a my teammates get a little bit of poke in. I can just go ham. I think we can end the game. But I decided to make a pick and rumble with this alts. Just want to get numbers advantage as soon as possible. Kill the rumble, kill the nocturne, and now it should be easy peasy. Lemon Squeezy. And we BM a little bit here with the stopwatch. That's not really a... Uh, that's not one of the pillars. BMing. But it's optional. If you're up this much, you, you can. You can afford to do it. And that's, uh, that, that's, a, that's a wrap. Welcome back, guys, to game number four of the Jungle Guide. The fourth pillar that I want to cover is going to be to... Think before you make a play. Um, anytime you're looking to do something proactive, whether you're going for a kill, starting an objective, um, you know, taking on a team fight, you want to make sure that you are considering the consequences and considering the risk reward of the situation and not just blindly going in and playing over aggressive. That's a issue that I have kind of, you know, uh, I've always had as a player back in the day back in season seven i was a gangplank player before i started picking up warwick and i used to die eight times a game on both gangplank and warwick and i was hard stuck diamonds for that reason i was when i was doing vod reviews and trying to figure out you know what i'm doing wrong and how i can improve i realized pretty quickly that a lot of my 
like I I would do a lot of damage in my games and get a lot of kills, but a lot of my deaths just did not make any sense. I would like tower dive level one with a or one v one with a lead, or you know throw away a big bounty for no reason at all. And I, instead of ever like you know thinking you know I can't fight this fight, I would just go in and always try to outplay it, and that's not. That's not the proper way to go about anything in this game. You want to make sure that you're always considering what makes sense. And again, League's a, a game that's really about, you know, swaying the odds in your favor. If you're always playing, making plays with the odds in your favor, then you're going to be having a good time most of the time. Um, if you're going for like real coin flip plays or, or plays where the benefits just not at all near worth the risk, then don't go, you know, have some patience, have some discipline. Um, don't be all ADHD of, all over the place. Um, so yeah, like that, that's like uh, one of the, probably one of the, the biggest things that I had, or most important things that I had to work on as a player um, many years ago in order to improve as fast as I did. I went from like the moment I started thinking before taking on fights, my average deaths per game dropped by two. And I went from like Diamond 4 to Master Tier within a matter of like just two months. It had massive results and instead of throwing tons of games, tons of leads, or just inting my face off before, you know, I could get to a point where I ha could have an impact, um, we were able to just be in a much better position in most of our games. So, I mean, it's, it's a pretty simple tip. Um, if you, I mean, even if you're not an overly aggressive player, if you're someone who has the opposite problem and you play too safe, it's it's still worth considering. You, at the end of the day, you still want to like think um, about your proactive plays and just try to make sense with everything. Like everything should have a goal in this game. You shouldn't just be fighting champions for no reason. You shouldn't be playing for just because it feels good in the moments. You want to you want to play in a way that's just going to win you games. So and that that requires thinking and yeah. Um, so this game right here, I mean, the reason I wanted to actually kind of showcase this game as well is because of the fact that my my laners this game were kind of. Like, at least my mid lane and my bot lane were pretty weak early on. They actually fell behind. And as a result, Technom was a lot stronger than me and actually had Pryo. In the previous games that we covered, I was, you know, usually kind of snowballing pretty hard. And by the time the mid game came around, we'd be a pretty well oiled machine. And my entire team would be strong. But this game, not, not exactly the same. As we see, bot lane's feeding a little bit. This is a solo queue classic. Bot lane's feeding. My mid laner got solo killed by a Teemo mid lane. And instead of having, you know, having like the ability to do whatever we want, we have to play a little bit more smarts and more reserves. And we don't have as many play playmaking opportunities this game. We have to actually focus more on farming because of the fact that there's just not as many openings available to us. With that said, we still gotta, you know, consider what are our openings. And because of the fact that our openings aren't as common, we gotta make sure that we're able to be there when there is one. So, bot lane's feeding a little bit, um, which kind of sucks. Um, they, they do have, you know, Ezreal, Nautilus, which isn't too bad for Warwick to gank, but because we have a poke bot lane, I need. I really need them to be able to poke down the Ezreal and Nautilus before I can consider a gank down there, um, or else we're just probably not going to have enough damage, especially considering they're behind already. Uh, but this Camille Trinomir top lane, as I mentioned before, like Bruiser's top lane is is a, is is kind of a lane that Warwick wants to uh, camp a lot of the times, regardless of the Bruiser, whether it's Irelia, Camille, Trinomir, Jax, whatever, any Bruiser that's top lane. Warwick can usually get behind them and DPS them down with, with your top laner pretty easily. That is assuming you also have a, a bruiser. It does kind of depend at the end of the day. Um, but right here we notice that 
Trinomir has a really good lane state, so the wave's frozen. Camille can't really walk up in CS. So my presence here, even if Camille doesn't walk up in, in, in Greed here, she still starts to kind of slowly fall behind in her lane. But she does end up walking up. I punish. I get a really nice E off there. I'm able to use my E to cancel her E2. Uh, key thing there is that I use it on the E2. Um, if I try to fear her before her E hits the wall, then she's still going to sling herself towards the wall and she'll be able to jump after half a second anyways. I have to make sure that her E hits the wall first and then I can cancel the grapple completely. So just, just kind of a small tip versus Camille. Obviously, you have to get kind of close to her to make that work, so it's not... It's not something you can do every gank, but... It's something to look for when you are ganking Camille's work. You want to try to get close to her so that you can deny that escape. Bot lane's dying again. Kind of sucks. Also, I have to give up this this Herald Prio. Tima rotated for it. I can't contest. My Trinmere also has to recall. Kind of sucks here. Um, bot lane died again. So a slow, a slow start from my team here. I'm, I'm actually doing doing fine myself, but that's just kind of the way it goes. I got, do got to consider here that Camille's still pushed up a little bit, and I have my ultimate available, so I'm looking to see if there's an opportunity. Um, but I, I, right here, what I end up thinking is, you know, let's go for mid lane instead because Azir has ultimates. He can scoop the team back and we can get a free kill, but I run into a shroom, which means that I lose a gank opportunity mid and top lane. Kind of sucks, but it's fine. You spot Hecarim on the Scuttle Crab, and again, he's stronger than me right now, and he also has lane prio in, uh, in every lane. I mean, yeah, Ezreal just died in the enemy team, but uh, Emo has, has a little bit of mid lane prio. I think we lose the 2v2 pretty handily. So I'm not willing to take that on. I'm just going to have to accept that uh, Hecum's able to control the river. We'll just farm what we can at the moment. And kind of just look bot lane at the moment. Because that's, that's the only lane where we can actually make an impact right now. Obviously top lane just got a kill. But also across the map. Azir just recalled. Teemo recalled. And we have our ultimate up. So we want to look for a play. But with everyone coming back from base, we're not able to make one. So I just, just farm it out. Yeah, nothing, if there's nothing that you can do, you just kind of farm by default. But I'm still looking to make something happen. I'm, I'm trying to see, like, you know, is there an opening anywhere? Right here, I could recall. Um, but because it's a fairly slow game, you know, I realize, you know what, maybe we can look for a pick on this Ezreal. And we managed to make it work. Really good e-follow. Right there, I basically, like, once they crashed the wave, I wasn't sure what their bot lane was going to do. Maybe they just back off completely, but if they do, then I'm just wasting five seconds. It's not like really the end of the world there. But if they do something like that and split up, now I suddenly have a free pick on the Ezreal, which is, which is nice. And here, uh, instead, of, instead of recalling, because it's a slow game with not many opportunities, I decided to create an opportunity. I know that uh, Ezreal, when he comes back from base, him and Nautilus are going to be looking to probably killed my Xerath and Twitch here because they're very squishy. They haven't bought. I mean, if, if you're like the enemy bot lane right now, you would obviously be really hungry to make, get something back here after dying two times in a row. And have, having a stronger 2v2. So I just sit in this bush and chill because I have my ultimate back up. Well, it's not back up. It's, I just never used it. And I'm able to come back from the bush after... Let our team bait up. And we're able to pick up another kill. Don't need to use our ultimate either. You might wonder why I didn't ult the Ezreal. It's because of the fact that... I need to follow him over the wall anyways. Like The only way I ever kill Ezreal there is if I Q follow him over the wall. So... I need to do that first and then I can ult him. But because I didn't get the Q follow off, there's no point using your ultimate. And sadly... Bot lane. I actually should have pinged my bot lane back here because this is like a fairly, fairly obvious gank that was kind of going to kind of come. Like their wave was, was for the most part kind of fine. They could have just reset, but it's whatever. Um, we just have to go back to our jungle right now. And because we're like we don't have Tiamat right now, this is this is a pretty awkward uh, game because 
we just bought two double longsword on our, our first recall, so we can get a little, little bit more dueling power and gank power. But uh, I'm really close to my Triforce here, and it's obviously like it's already 12 minutes into the game, so I don't really need the amount to farm fast. I just need, I need my Triforce to have stronger fighting power. So we're just going to go ahead and just farm up for our item. And look to reset on our Triforce when we have it here. I remember being kind of tilted here that Azir took my Raptors. And Trinomir took my Krugs beforehand as well. I'm also really close to Triforce. That was especially bad. That's fine. I think uh, it's my bad. Even though my ultimate's up here and my Ghost is coming up as well. I'm very close to a really strong power spike. So I shouldn't be looking to force any play like the only the only way I'm going to gank any lane here is if it's like really free if it's a really really free angle then I might go for it I decide to just go for this dragon though and I think that the reason why I go for this dragon is because of the fact that we saw Hecarim topside I think this is bad apparently that was worded as well that was kind of bad by me I, sh I really shouldn't have gone for that um, without my sweeper. Because that could have gone bad if that ward didn't wear out. The, the general logic there is that, you know, I saw Hecarim top lane. And bot lane was... Pushing in, looking to... Like, like their bot lane, I, I, I don't really know how to explain it. But I feel like their bot lane just was not interested in roaming. They were more focused in their own lane. So I feel like I had a window to sneak sneak the, the dragon. Right here though, Tremir gets Camille really low, so we just pop Ghost and our ultimates. Get a free pick, walk away. And I want to fight this Hecarim, but I don't want to fight in his jungle because then his Teemo will be able to collapse on me. So I'm trying to bait him towards River. He doesn't bite. Um, but because he doesn't bite, this gives us an opening to look for Peril. I actually remember that this is a mistake on my end here. So Azir overextends while I'm on Herald. And what I should have done here is just finish the Herald. But instead I tried to join the fight even though even knowing that we have a numbers disadvantage here. And I end up dying along with the Azir. Azir shouldn't have been pushed up like that. You know, because of the fact that I was I was taking an objective for free. But I also just shouldn't like like Azir inting shouldn't affect my decision making there. I should recognize that's a bad play and it's risky and it's not it's not worth the reward. That was definitely like a situation where I didn't really think before going in. If I thought a little bit longer, I would have realized, you know, the Herald is, is a free objective. It's it's essentially two kills. Uh, well, it's actually it's actually one, it's one kill in gold. But it's also, it also gives us, you know, power taking potential, so. I'd rather take the guaranteed, the guaranteed win than the coin flip play there. Because that was a coin flip. That wasn't like a high percentage play. That was a low percentage one. But uh, with everyone, everyone backed off, we have that, we have a small opening to be able to take this, this dragon while we can. And again, we're just gonna kind of farm up. We do have we do have our ultimate up, so the moment that enemies champions start showing up in this map, I'm gonna start thinking where can I make a play. They're trying to flank this Azir, so I'm thinking maybe bot lane, but he just scoots away. No biggie there. So um, yeah, we'll just, we'll just continue our, our our clear here, but my eyes are on bot lane. Ezreal and Nautilus look to be pushed up a little bit. And we obviously win that 2v2. Yeah, I think we're just going to head down here. We're, we're going to head down here because of the fact that this uh, bot lane's pushing in. So I assume that their bot lane's going to try to kill this turret and overextend. I get spotted out by the Nautilus, sadly. So we just have to back off. But that that's basically what I was looking for. And right now, my... My entire team's mid lane doing basically nothing. <laughs> this, is, this is a very uh, a jank play. So 
So I come here to try to make something happen. Help out. Uh, another mistake in my end right here. Everyone on the map is MIA or mid lane. I'm thinking that this is a 3v3. That's what I think it is. But everyone's MIA. So this is like definitely a situation where I can easily get collapsed on. I ult away and get away with it. But I shouldn't have had to ult away in that situation. Because obviously that was just not going to work. There was basically no reward there. Again, another situation where I didn't think before going aggressive. And as a result, now I don't have ultimates. It's going to be a lot harder for me to help out my team if a fight breaks out, which does. A fight does break out right here. The good news is they are pretty low, and I have ghosts, so... We're able to kind of come in here and clean up one kill. But if I had ultimate, I can also kill the Teemo here as well, so... Just unfortunate situation. Able to get away alive. With three people dead... I want to punish. When enemy when enemy team is dead, when you when you win a fight, that's not the opportunity to just recall or you know, farm your own jungle camps. You want to you have numbers advantage. You want to take what you can get. Even if it, it can be anything. Whether you're just pushing out the lane or counter jungling or clearing out wards, you want to make sure that you're you're taking something from the enemy team while you have the numbers advantage. And right here, after counter jungling a little bit, I noticed that this wave's pretty big top lane. So I'm thinking that maybe like Ezreal or someone's gonna show up and try to take it. But they all go mid lane, so we just look for this flank instead. My team's poking them under the turret, so I'm just trying to see if we're gonna poke them down a bunch. Maybe I can fly in, get a kill, and walk away. But Ezreal gets caught, sadly, so we just have to go top lane and shove out the, the top wave. As a jungler, this is something that you can do a lot um, in solo queue. In, in the mid, mid and late game, which is just push out the side lanes because people oftentimes in solo queue aren't... Like your laners are, are, aren't going to pick up every single side lane. Side wave. So just take them if no one's nearby. You don't want to like steal from your teammates. If your top laner is heading top lane, then don't just, you know, nab his wave, wave from him. But... If no one's there, just take it. That way you keep up, keep up the pressure and you're keeping yourself fed. Making sure that your team is getting all the CS that you can. Got our Titanic Hydra though, which is really nice. Uh, really good power spike on my end. And with Dragon heading coming up, this is a perfect opportunity to look for a play. So I want to, I want to group with my team down here. Azir also has teleport, so that that's like another thing I'm considering. I, I press tab, I notice that Azir has teleports. So we actually, despite the fact that he's split pushing top lane, this is uh this looks really good. Twitch just got a pick on the Ezreal. Camille TP's back in, and this this feels like a really good play honestly. Um, even though I even though I get caught out and die. I didn't expect to get collapsed in that hard, but um, I felt pretty good about this play overall, but it ends up going badly because Azir just didn't TP in. Like, that's literally at the end of the day, like, all that really happened here. Azir should have teleported in, but I can't control him. I'm going to make the play assuming he's going to teleport because most of the time he will, but he didn't. But uh, it's whatever. It happens. Again, you're playing, you're playing the odds. Sometimes... Even if the odds are in your favor, it's just not going to work out. Sometimes your teammate just doesn't teleport and win the fight. Actually, in solo queue, this happens a lot. Split pushing solo laner. Not an uncommon situation, but... Just whatever. Uh, they decided to recall. The entire enemy team recalled here. Dragon's left open. And obviously, this is the third dragon. So, I'm thinking right here, we can just wait for our team. We'll have a good 4v4. Azir also still has TP, so we can maybe make this a 5v4. But Trinomir starts to just starts rushing this dragon, which I don't really like. I don't like this play because of the fact that now I just die. And we're not able to fight back because we have a numbers disadvantage. I think we should have just waited for Xerath to show up. And we could have 
taken a uh, better 4v4 play, but it's whatever. I mean, we, at the end of the day, we got the dragon, so we have soul point now. So we'll take it. Uh, but this does give them the opening for Baron. And I think that like, like, that's basically like what makes this a bad play. Because yeah, we get the dragon, we lose two people, and that's whatever. But it's now they're able to just rush the Baron. And Trinomir is not able to contest. Doesn't want to contest. So overall, pretty bad. But it's fine. I did what I could do there. I'm going to head up towards top lane here. Because we have a blood trail. I don't think that I'm going to be able to take this Baron in time. It's just getting shredded. But I am wondering if I'll be able to maybe make a pick on anyone. To get poked out. And voila, this Ezreal is 2 HP. Smite his ass. Get a kill on this Nautilus. And uh, now I'm hunting for the Teemo. I think he just ends up recalling here though. With the Baron powered recall. So we're only, only able to get two. But. Even though we're only able to get two. We still have. It's still a 3v3 situation. And we have our ultimate available. So I'm feeling pretty good. Just spent all my gold. Had a power spike, so I think I can go for an invade. But my Ezreal, or sorry, my Twitch ends up dying, so I decided to just walk away now. Because I can, I'm not gonna win a one v two. We could win a two v two, but we can't win a one v two. Now we just have to push out the side lane and walk away, wait for our Twitch to come back, and then we can try to make a pick in the side lane or take on a team fight. And again, because. We're looking for a team fight or we're waiting to regroup. We just farm in the meantime. Because that's what we do. But, uh, Tramir goes top lane to defend top. Azir, Azirus mid. Enemy team starts looking to siege top lane and they actually hunt for this Tramir on the Paradigm. Which is kind of crazy because Tramir has his ultimate. But I end up landing a really nice flank on this Ezreal. Like this flank here was godlike and takes away their main DPS and we're able to follow up with Teemo after, right afterwards. So, game changing play right there. The enemy team was a little bit over aggressive, but the real highlight there is the fact that I took a, a flank angle to get on their fed backline carry. Well, actually, both of them. You now, most people say Warwick's bad at team fighting. Uh, uh, bad at team fighting, but it really just comes down to the angle you take to approach fights. I guess that wasn't like a 5v5 team fight, that was like a, a skirmish, I guess, but it still applies. If you run, sh if I ran straight at the enemy team there, I'm gonna get CC'd and die. If I take a flank angle like I'm an assassin, then we're able to pick off their back line and get a triple kill. That's the difference right there. These Teemo shrooms are obnoxious as hell as always. It's Teemo. Uh, I actually, I'm sitting on a lot of gold here. I should just recall right now, honestly. I I don't know why I'm not recalling this situation. This is just greedy. It's greedy in a bad way. I don't need to collect every single camp before I reset. It's just not very reliable because because right now all my the reason is, is because all of my teammates are on the map now. I should have recalled when everyone else was recalling, but now that now that everyone's on the map, everyone's vulnerable and I can't help them. We do end up getting a pretty good recall though, so it's it's okay. But like like this right here is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. They're looking to go on to Zier and Twitch. They do fight back pretty well. Twitch, Twitch lays out some pretty good damage. Again, looking for another flank angle on this one. Take out the Nautilus. And now we're looking for this dragon. They got two people dead. We got two people dead as well, but I still have my ultimate up. And I'm very, very strong. Hecarim's top lane as well. This is just a free dragon. The moment that, he that Hecarim shows up top lane here, it's just free. Like, e even if Ezreal and Nautilus come and try to fight this, we just hard win the fight. Or hell, we don't even have to necessarily, like, 
go for the fight, we can just focus the dragon and, and get the soul for free. So that's huge. Which right here shows the value of playing towards objectives. This game, like, five minutes ago was looking kind of bad for us. Before I got that triple kill bot lane, we were behind. But now we're ahead, we're ahead a little bit. And then, then we got soul, so now we're actually ahead a fair amount. I decided not to ult this Hecarim here because I was... I didn't want to ult him to ult. Which might be kind of a bad way of thinking because of the fact that my ultimate's on a pretty low cooldown, as you saw, 55 seconds. But it's fine. I'm just going to clear out a camp here. I'm trying to get a level up. But uh, Trinomir takes on a fight in the top lane, so we're going to head over here. See if we can help out. I want I want I try to I try to steal this Grom so that I can get level 16. And then we're going to Q follow this Teemo when he approaches the wall. We'll get stuff there. And now we have numbers advantage, so we just want to just hard push the wave in. And try to siege this turrets. And what works bad at sieging. I mentioned this before, works very bad at sieging. So you usually don't want to like. Well, usually you don't want to run at the enemy like that. But because of the because they showed bot lane, we have a huge numbers advantage. We have Ocean Dragon and I'm fed. We're able to do it. But I notice how I was posturing for like a flank angle rather than a like running straight at them initially. I only ran straight at them once I saw that Hecarim was bot. And now we can just look to end the game. And we end up doing that. GG.